All right. Hey, everybody. It's Ryan here with Pi Records, and I'm here with Jordan Stam from Drunk Dial Records. How you doing, Jordan? Hey, I'm doing great. Awesome. So Martin Winch interviewed, I interviewed Martin Winch, and he, you're one of the ba- the record labels that he specifically mentioned is out there doing something really unique, and it's totally punk rock, and uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what you do. All right, well, uh, I run a seven-inch only record label, and uh, the concept is that we get a band together we get them drunk in a studio and then while they're drinking and on that one day they are writing and recording an original song as well as covering a classic and uh uh we've done let's see we're working on the eighth right now and uh really i guess the goal is to capture something that normally would die on the vine um something that you would do you know in the back of the van on on tour or hanging out in your bedroom you have like a chorus but it's not very good you never really work on it this is forcing a band to kind of go out of their creative comfort zones to you know work on that one idea they had and go for it and um, you know it's relying on their creativity and their you know their unity as a band to make this thing happen and uh, you know it's been good so far surprisingly good um all the covers have been great too people have had a uh, you know, that to fall back on. They have uh, their cover dialed in and uh, no pun intended. <laughs> and they get to be uh, a little loose about the uh, the original that they're writing. It's all been great. Uh, I love it. We're, uh, you know, it's it was a dumb idea we had at a bar. It's like, oh, that would be fun to do. And slowly but surely we've realized we've refined the idea. I don't know why I say we, it's me, me and my cat, uh, the royal we, but the idea has been refined and now we're just looking to put artists out of their creative comfort zone rather than get drunk people barely being able to play their instrument, just like singing about pizza and beer, which I don't mind, um, but that's not really what I'm going for. So we've had bands with like a sober person or a non-alcoholic person doing Molly. There's been you know, people who go all out on the beer, people who have done mushrooms their entire session rather than just drinking. So we're just trying to push the boundaries and do cool things and put it out on vinyl and sell it to our buddies. Um, I don't know, that was, that was rambling, but- uh, No, not at all. We just uh, had a, we had a fun idea and we ran with it. And that's just what we keep on trying to do. So go with, go with fun ideas. Now I listened to- uh... In preparation, I listened to Fakes. Um, okay. Your compilation. And I was like, yes. Blown away because I was not expecting to hear something so refined and something so wonderful. It's the only word I can think of because the songs are really good and they're recorded really yeah. well. And you could not tell they were done by a bunch of drunk people. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was more of a uh, quarantine compilation. So I'm not sure how many of them were drunk. What we do for the compilations is we go with those weird ideas. So for the beginning of quarantine, I don't know, it was like March or April, we got a bunch of bands together, stuck at home to record on whatever instruments they could to do, you know, uh, a compilation there. So then we, that kind of, you know, broke the the mold for what Drunk Dial was willing to do. Um, and that's that was just a fun idea that wasn't necessarily tied to being drunk. What Fakes was about, not necessarily tied to being drunk, was having, again, in quarantine or lockdown, having a compilation, nothing but songs that were only in fictional universes. So like uh that thing you do has of course that thing you do by the the wonders josie and the pussycats there's a bunch of these and uh it was an idea i had i wanted to put it out on vinyl but because you know i wanted to make it big i wanted to do it It was such a fun idea but we were still stuck in quarantine like a a year later no one could really go into studio so we just said whatever let's do another digital got people we just 
you know, we asked people if they wanted to do it. And what was interesting is almost to a band, they all had a favorite song from a fictional band that they've always wanted to cover. So I think it was, it was, uh, it was just great that we had huge Josie and the Pussycats fans or gem fans. They were so into it and ready to go. And they, uh, they had about a month to do it, but I think they had been thinking about these songs for a long time because they really, they went for it. And it was a great compilation. I love every song and, you know, I want to do more, uh, but you got to go back to doing our, our flagship seven inches. So yeah. we have to put off the next comp for a little while. So I was listening to a bunch of songs. Uh, the song by Careful is yes. super catchy. A Kiss at the End of the Rainbow. Um, yes. From it, A Mighty Wind. It, it, it's uh, it, it's uh, like, I, like I said, I was really, really impressed. Um, Threshold. Yes. Oh, so good. So good. Better than the original. And there's uh, some of those other songs, they didn't have much to compare it with. Some of those songs were 30 seconds and, you know, awful. And these songs were elevated. But Threshold was a damn good song from that movie. And Maddie Grace just destroyed it and made it a better song. It was it was incredible. I love that song. It's so good. And um, somebody I'm interviewing this week, Haley Crusher with uh, the Thorazines. Um, yes. That was fantastic. I uh, yeah, I, I think she's great, and mm. they did a, a great, great song. Um, how Howard Love is it? Howard Love, Hound of Love, Hounds of Love. Yes, Hound of Love. Uh, Andrew from the Mean Jeans. So when he's uh, I, the drummer from Mean Jeans, I I actually have uh, Mean Jeans records and uh. So I'm like, where, where, uh, where have I heard that name? Uh, something sounded familiar about it. But that song, when I was in college, uh, Billy Madison was super popular. And yeah. uh, to hear that song realized in, in more of a, not serious, but more of a professional manner. To hear it in the studio, I was like, oh my God, this is so great. Yes, well, with Andrew, pretty much anything I do now, I have to run it by him. Like, if I can get him involved or his okay, his thumbs up, then I go for it. And so, you know, I kind of did that. I was about to quit drunk dial, and Andrew was into doing one, and that kept it going. With Stay Home, that compilation, I first asked Andrew, and he was into it. And then I used his name, basically, to get a bunch of other people involved. With Fakes, I... You know, say, uh, is it a good idea? Am I stupid? And, you know, like maybe 12 hours later, he sends me a rough version of that song. And it's incredible. And it's like proof of concept. Him behind me, I feel like we can get it to, you know, enough people will listen to it for just him. And, you know, he's such a supporter and he's so great. And I love what he's doing. And, man, I put I put so many bad ideas <laughs> by him. Um, I'm always trying to get him to do something because I think anything that he does is incredible. And, you know, I, uh, I that was just a, such a great song. And the way he added the, the hemorrhage and the head thing at the afterward. He just, he's brilliant and underrated. And I love that guy. Again, I think I've told you, everyone you mentioned, I love. And it's true. They're all great. And they, uh, I wouldn't be here without these guys. That's awesome. So something I like to touch on is the friendships that you have with Rita Records, Dirt Cult Records, mm -hmm. Slappy Little Finger, uh, yeah. Slappy Little uh, Numbers. Um, it, it's it's very interesting how you guys all work together. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know the music scene is, you know people would say it's just a, a bunch of friends passing the same $20 bill around. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, the whole thing is kind of the same way. I think it's, it's kind of a lonely existence to run a label and not to have the, the joy of getting out on stage and, you know, 
I just, I think it's a, it's more isolated. And when you meet other label people, you want to talk shop and, you know, complain about bands and shipping and all these things. And uh, it's just like an informal bond and we help each other out and, and we're all cool people. And, you know, Dirt Colts and uh, Chris Mason, you know, asked him uh, advice about one little thing. And he not only gave me advice, he helped me forward um, with promotion that I wasn't able to do on my own. He, you know, showed me how. Um, Rita, I know through working with Haley and the Crushers and we just, you know, talk. I'm, fr I'm not friends. I'm a fan of Pale Lips. I, uh, I just try to support, you know, everyone. Uh, snappy little numbers. Talk to me on Instagram. I don't know. It's mostly Instagram friends. And, you know, that's kind of an intimate thing. And we cross promote. Um, I don't know. I don't really. I don't know. Maybe I get stumped. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're just a bunch of weirdos um, and we know our lives and we just, we bond over that. And, you know, a lot of them are musicians in their own right. Um, I'm a big fan of everything that Chris Mason puts out and has done music with um, snappy little numbers. I don't know. We're just buddies. I love his music too. I can't explain weird label stuff i guess uh we're just a bunch of weirdos who are friends <laughs> so you're in a band then no i'm actually not in the band i was realizing i was actually the only one of those label friends that am not in a band so maybe i'm the only one lonely <laughs> for the recognition and the stage but i like being in the background i don't this is very uncomfortable for me because i like to stay behind the scenes i say we a lot of the times online because I don't like, you know, saying it's me. It just feels weird, and uh, I don't I like being. A, I don't like being a boss. I like being a, a grunt and a, a fan, and that's what I try to try to be. Awesome. Well, I I totally get that. This uh, doing interviews is totally out of my comfort zone. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm usually behind the scenes. I work in TV. So I work behind okay. the scenes, hey, cool. um, but I see interviews every day. It's all I see is interviews. So I said, hey, how about doing a podcast with just music interviews? And um, that's what kind of forced me to come out of my shell a little bit. Um, so what are you working on right now? So... Um, the problem is I lost my job baking, uh, because of COVID. So I have very little income. So I've been working on a lot of these comp projects that just require, you know, getting a bunch of people together and raising money for charities and back to the bands and stuff where, uh, it doesn't require me to spend a lot of money and it doesn't really make me any money it kind of treading water, keeping the label alive. But, uh, we have been able to get going on drunk dial number eight with a band called the dumpies, which um, you know, I didn't really know about until I read their interview in razor cake uh, a few issues back about how they tour in different countries that you wouldn't really expect. I think Asia, South America, I want to say Africa, that might be wrong. Um, but they talked about having their own label hovercraft and you know, careers and jobs and they're adults, but they still love making music and they're spending all their money putting out dumb records like I am. And their music is really great. And they're great. And, uh, you know, we, we got together and recorded something. They actually got together in a cabin in Astoria, Oregon on New Year's Eve just got so many beers so many beers and uh recorded uh, a great original that's actually a three-part song and all three parts are earworms they did a cover that's amazing it's in it's in press right now we'll have it out in like april we actually were talking earlier today about when we're going to put it out that's why i'm hesitating about 
what I'm allowed to say, what I'm not allowed to say, but I'm pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure it's coming out at the end of April. And I guarantee you it's a, <laughs> a great record and I, I'm really excited for it. Um, every record I put out, every project I work on is my favorite thing I've ever done. And this is no exception in it. It's going to be a hard it's hard to follow because I think it's a great record. The art is amazing. Uh, I'm just really excited for it. I'm excited to have another record to, to push. And, you know, there's about five or six other bands that want to do it. And I want to work with them. And we're kind of just waiting for the basis to come from the other coast or this studio that we want to work with to open back, back up or me to have money to put out <laughs> records we're waiting we're just hoping uh we can get started again because we're all we're all ready for respective moves forward but uh dumpies is coming out soon uh can't wait for it. it's gonna be great i can't wait to share it now these are all pretty much punk rock bands um, um yeah so <laughs> did i cut you off <laughs> no no go ahead <laughs> Um, yes, I consider them all punk bands, even though I don't think other people would. I think it's a, it's a, a loose label, genre label. What, um, like, like you said, you, you were reading, reading um, up on the, dump, the Dumpies. Mm -hmm. what, what draws you to a band that says, hey, they would make a perfect fit to, to Drunk Down? Well, I get a lot of people offering. And the problem is, like I said, we're poor and we can only take on so many projects at one time because we're really interested in making something really good putting quality things together really good art bunch of vinyl colors and if there's really no profit margin in seven inches and if you're a record label doing nothing but seven inches it's really boring to talk about profit margins but i say this only to to say that we can only put out you know at tops for a year um sometimes only one or two a year and so we have to choose bands based on what works at that moment. Sometimes it's a band that says, you know, hey, we're, oh man, every single band has been different. So the first couple have been my friends. I needed a first, a first record, a proof of concept. I'm not, you can't really get a, a good established band to get drunk for a brand new label and then expect them to uh, you know do it do it service do your service because it seems like such a stupid idea so the first couple of bands they had to be friends and the first person i ever asked was the hound of love and uh you know that really opened the doors everything everything has been different let's see friends uh poppy fimbres from uh bands I love, Mascaras, um, Savila, a bunch of Portland bands. He's a, an amazing drummer. He's a, He's got about 20 bands. He just hit me up one day and said, hey, this is a great idea. Let's do one. And I'm a huge fan of his. I've done nothing but my friend's bands. And so I said, hell yeah, let's do it. And I did it. And it was a, a scare. I think his 40th band or something like that. And it was incredible. Um, from there, you know, I talk to Houndy, like I said. After that, I fell in love with a song I heard, I think Spotify Discover or something. And it happened to be a local band called Crybabe. Uh, this song, Soft Honk, was just, you know, an earworm and I loved it. And I don't know, bizarrely confident or weird, or I didn't take my pills that day. And I just, you know, I hit him up and I said, does this sound like a good idea? Do you want to do this with me? Let's do it. And they were into it and they did it. Um, Hakan was number six. They hit me up on Instagram. No, actually hit them up on Instagram. I just discovered them and I said, hey, you guys are great. I love you. And then, you know, six hours later, they said, thanks, let's do a record. And, you know, uh, a couple hours later, we were talking about doing a record. They've all been great. Um, I don't know. Dave, number eight, Dave Williams was a really special one for me because I'm a huge fan of his. I was hoping that someday I would be able to talk to him to, you know, do a record with him was, you know, a bucket list sort of thing. And 
when I put out this Ramon stay home comp, uh, we had a couple people fall out and oh, I think I was just talking to him about maybe mastering it. And he said, Oh, Hey, let me just do a song. Uh, he mastered it. He did a song. We became buddies. Um, then he, I don't even know how it asked. It's, it's all a blur, but he offered to do a drunk dial with his new project and it was the dream come true. And uh, it's a great record. That's careful, a new project. And I just felt so honored to be, uh, you know, the home of his new solo project after a, a giant career of nothing but hugely influential bands and bands I love. And, you know, it's hard to not be a fanboy around him. And I've kind of had to separate how many records of his I own and know by heart with also trying to be cool and a label and feel like, Hey, I'm capable of doing good things and promoting your band. I'm not just a, uh, you know, a, a goblin trying to put out more music and learn about crusades backstories and Hey, like, what's it like in Ottawa? And do you really know all the creeps and is Steve Adamick weird? Like, I don't know. He's just, it's all so cool. And to be dialed into these people is, uh, is great. And that's not the answer to your question. <laughs> um, I should have had a beer. I would have been more focused. Uh, bands can't really do anything to be on my label. It's just, it's very, it's weird. We become friends. Opportunities open up. It's a, uh, there's no real submission of demo process or anything. We just, we talk, it's a uh, lightning in a bottle or it just never really happens. Um, I'd love to have more money and put out more bands, but right now it has to be, you know, weird, ideal, furtive steps, I guess. Um, and so far, every single release has been better than the other and, People are really into the the concept and they want to do it. And I want to keep going. We just need to keep putting them out and keep selling them. Yeah, man. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> I like blacked out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, so are you in Oregon? Is that where you are? Yeah, I'm in Portland. So there's a lot going uh, on. I've been here for like 18 years. Yeah, yeah there is. Um, there's such a lot going on there. Yeah, I feel like uh, Dave Mason described it a lot where uh, there's so many different genres that are like have thriving scenes within Portland, but they're completely separate. And, you know, that they were at different bars, different sections of the city. Um, and I just don't know any of these bands and I don't understand how these, you know, sometimes they get press and like, oh, how are they taking these huge tours and I've never heard of these, these people and they're in my city and I've been here for 18 years like it's bizarre how many things are happening in Portland and how many active scenes there are and it seems like someone like me would you know know some of them but I have no idea outside of my own little scope um it's a great city for that it's really been really depressing to live here for a year without the the scene being really active and the the live music scene being you know the thing to live here for so what um what 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 did you do for your, your full-time job you said you were baking yeah i've just my first job actually was working at a record label when i was 15 and so that's always been my passion and everything else has kind of been a a side gig to pay for it even when i wasn't doing a label it was it's they just been grunt work to someday eventually put out records but you know i fell into vegan baking and portland's a great place it's a vegan mecca and uh they're all music fans and weirdos and bakers kind of fall into the weird counter life cycle and being you know being weird and into loud music and smoking pot so it's it kind of uh it worked hand in hand. It's been a perfect career for me, um, but it's gone. So I've been able to do anything, but uh, I'm, you know, mostly a baker and whatever else I have to do. I have 
you know, side hustles. I had to do Postmates to afford the label for a while. I was selling plasma to afford the label for a while. Really anything I have to do in service of the, the beast of putting out records. And it's been a, you know, a monkey on my back since I was 15. It feels like, it feels like my real job in life. Everything else is a, you know, a side hustle, even if it is a career one day. I have, uh, I have noticed that a lot of people, um, when they put out records, they're using the the resources from their like the the income they get from their jobs to to do that, which is pretty yeah. much what I do too. Um, I want to be in music full time, but unfortunately, that's very very difficult. Yeah. But, but you're going the extra steps. I mean, you're selling plasma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, records are really cool. <laughs> and I'm working with people I love and nothing makes me happier. Like I was going to therapy for a while. My therapist was bummed out about just what a freaking bummer I was. And when I started the label again, it was like, oh, well, you're actually happy about something. It was kind of rude of her, but it was true. It's the only thing that really gives me that, that jolt and that, drive to to do my stupid job or to do anything really um i really now portion out my life with mail days and release things and if i don't have a release i get really depressed i need something to be stressed out about i need deadlines i need the next thing to do on a project and uh, i don't know what i would give up to keep this engine going it, I don't, I hope there doesn't, I don't know. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I'd go, uh, I'd go a long way to keep it going because it's really the only thing that I enjoy anymore. Um, I've, I've always been hugely into music, emotionally connected and just, there's nothing better than putting out records. I love it. And I'm going to keep doing it. Awesome. There's uh, something in, in that, last part that you said that really really connects with me um i too go to therapy from time to time and um for me i find it doesn't work um but i do i i do see a psychiatrist too uh and mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm, I'm putting <laughs> that out there full well knowing people are going to see this <laughs> but yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure oh yeah there's a there shouldn't be a stigma attached i uh I'm a big overshare. Yeah, uh, I, so am I. Yeah. But, but the the one of the things that has made all the difference in my mental health is constantly staying busy. Like overbooking mm. my interv uh, overbooking my interviews, putting records out, uh reaching yeah. out reaching out to labels, just having that conversation and keeping busy and having something to look forward mm -hmm. to has been a big yeah big help so i totally identify with what you're saying mm -hmm. uh yeah it's this was even a huge step like i said talking being on camera um it sucks but i feel like i have to do it for the label and uh it in turn is helping me to probably get better at talking to people who are better at zooming um even though it's in service of this this record itch this music thing that is inside of us it really it's symbiotic and it helps us in other ways and you know like i was talking about awkwardly about the friends i've made um you know it's it's really cheesy to talk about how magical music is and the industry and the friends you make and everything but it's it's really true that i don't know i don't know how broken i would be without all the sad music i listen to in my life but i definitely <laughs> i think I think I went down with all the sad music for a while, but I don't think I could have recovered or been as whole of a person if it weren't for music educating me and lifting me up and creating this community and place for me to to exercise my own creativity and to meet people. It's I don't know. It's I could go on about it, but it's I wasn't expecting to uh, <laughs> get deep about music, but it's 
No, this is totally. I perfect. think we both understand that it's hugely important, and I think everyone in our community understands too. So we can all just tip our hats to each other, and yeah, we all get it. Music is a, a freaking great. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it, it really makes me feel good that people like you are out there that give their heart and soul to it. It's not just a uh, an ego thing. It's. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it it's something compels you to do it from your soul yeah yeah um that's true uh, i feel compelled um but i love it i don't i think most compulsions are bad we're getting dark but like i don't think there's any better um compulsion than wanting to get more involved and creative with music and sharing things with people and i think it's great I, I say go with that weird impulse absolutely absolutely so um where can people find you and like social media wise and uh mm -hmm. where can you get a drunk dial record well i'm really active on instagram um I think we all are, but that's been a huge base for my sharing and meeting people. And so Drunk Dial Records on Instagram, um, I'm really anywhere if you just look up Drunk Dial Records. I sell, you know, on Bandcamp, the normal places, drunkdialrecords.bandcamp.com. But my main, my main selling platform, I guess you'd call it, is Green Noise Records, which, which is a... Uh, you know, a partnership I've had from the very beginning and also, you know, one of the main reasons I'm able to continue to put out music is because of the support I've had from the three most recent owners of Green Noise, specifically Martin, uh, Marty Winch, who's there now. I sell, you know, exclusives through him. I, uh, you know, he's my main wholesale you know, resource, but also very integral to the success of Drunk Dial and, uh, you know, a great mentor and just awesome dude. He's a, uh, he's really supportive and awesome. And I don't know, I'm going to say, it, I love that guy. <laughs> um, he speaks Green very Noise, um, is, Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, with Green Noise, I moved to Portland. I'm going to tell a green noise story, I guess, but I love them because of their attachment to dirt nap, of course. But when I first moved to Portland and my first real vinyl buying kick, I was obsessed with Jay retard and getting all his old seven inches and the very first record store day, I believe he had something out with Beck, maybe the gamma ray split. And I was looking for the rare copy, of course. And I went to eventually Clinton where Ken had green noise. He didn't have any, any, uh, what are they called? Record store day titles. He wasn't really into that, but I went in there for the first time and there was this music playing and I loved it. It was incredible. And I asked him what it was. It was fucking marked men, the greatest band in like 40 years or since the Ramones <laughs> started dying. And so I bought a Marked Men album. I bought a High Tension Wires album. Then I started, you know, getting into Nap stuff. And, you know, every single thing he's done has been incredible. So I would eventually just start getting drunk, then walking over to Green Noise, talking to Ken, getting recommendations and learning all about his stuff. I didn't have a label at the time. I was just a, a regular vid video uh, visitor and uh, no, I really got into the scene. And it was during this time where he was on this incredible stretch with Mind Spiders, Potential Johns, Steve Adamick Band, Sonic Avenues, Low Culture, just, you know, mean jeans, just hit after hit after hit. So, you know, I was at Green Noise all the time uh, when it moved. I eventually made my way over there. It was not a walk I could do. So I had to go there sober and parking was terrible. So it was kind of a, didn't visit as much, but I started uh, my label at that time and 
wanted to sell it at Green Noise, of course, and then became friends with Gary, who was the owner at the time. He was super supportive. He started selling it on Green Noise. Of course, I knew Marty. Um, when he took it over, I guess Gary, you know, said, you know, this guy's cool. Make sure you keep selling his stuff. And I guess that's how Marty heard about it. And, you know, he understood what I was doing. He's been more supportive to me than I would be to anyone if the roles were switched. I've felt embarrassed at sometimes. I've felt, you know, like, why is he? I'm not good enough for him to be putting the green noise name behind him. Like I'm a, I'm a weirdo and he's just been so supportive and I wouldn't have the, you know, the roster I have now without his backing, I wouldn't have the sales I have now without his backing. And, um, that was a really long plug for green noise, but yeah, you can get my records at green noise records online and, uh, you know, a few other places around Portland, but, um, you know, that's that's my place and if there's anything i'm selling it'll go there and he gets all my exclusive things he'll get you know the the dumpies exclusives he sells my old stuff he, he keeps it going and uh you know he's he's i love that guy <laughs> <laughs> awesome so uh i just wanted to wrap it up by saying yeah yeah thank, please dear thank, god <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it was great to get to know you and yeah thank you for your time i i i know you Definitely. must have a million things going on um but thank you so much for being such a great guest and uh let's please stay in contact yeah uh thanks for having me i uh i really like what you're doing here and giving voices to the weirdo label operators um and to my friends it's it's really nice to hear them stumble over their words and talk about the reasons they're doing things and it really reaffirms what a cool scene we're all in and even if we're all just passing around the same twenty dollar bill like yeah i'm into it i'll i'll keep giving my buddies these twenty dollar bills because I, I love it and i i want to keep seeing all of our buddies put out things that make them feel good even though it's taking all their money and all their time and it makes them nervous um i'm just yeah ah, i don't know thanks for having me um yeah i'll talk to you soon cool